Well, today is May 7th, 2010, and we're in my home today with Barbara, known as Bobby Bateman. Uh, and when she was, before she was married, your maiden name was? Marsick. Marsick. And Barbara was in the United States Air Force from 1952 to 1954, and we're going to do an oral history today of her military experience. And Barbara, it seems funny to call you Barbara. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming over and doing this. Um, let's just start right in the beginning. Where were you born? What's your birthday? My birthday is 29th of April, 1933. Okay. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, Okay. in my grandmother's house. Middle of depression, so mother tells the story that they had fifty dollars and told the doctor it could either go to the, she could either go to the hospital or give it to the doctor, and the doctor thought I could be born at home. Okay. <laughs> um, in Chicago, or not a in, suburb. No, in, in Chicago. Chicago. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is that where you spent your youth mostly, mm, or no? Okay. Um, probably for about five years, and we moved to a farm in Ohio, and then during the Second World War, moved into Cleveland because my father could either go be drafted or he could go work in a war factory in Cleveland and that's what he chose since he had a family. Okay. And his age was why they had given him a choice. Mm -hmm. um, we moved around a fair amount. I, this is, moving here was my 17th move, so. Oh man. <laughs> so you moved around quite a bit. Yes, yeah. Wow. Mostly after we got married. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so did you go to high school then in Cleveland? Went to high school in Mentor, Ohio, which was Mentor. 25 miles east of Cleveland. Mentor, Ohio for high school. Um, Barbara, tell us how it is that you ended up being in the military. Well, um, I had wanted to go to college and my mother and I went to talk to the principal who said, we don't give scholarships to women because they just go to college to find a husband. And so I thought, well, I'll just go in the military and go on the GI Bill. And my brother was in the Air Force, so I chose the Air Force. And um, what year was that? 52? 52. 52. 19, January. 52. January 1952. And where did they first send you? To uh, uh, San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Tell us about your beginning experiences in San Antonio? Well, it was a lot of fun when I look back on it. It was also, oh, not scary, but different. Um, I was brought up to think I was pretty hot stuff, and when I got out in the world, I found out the world didn't care. <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> yeah, we all had that reality, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. And it was, the Air Force, really, as a separate organization, was only about five years old at the mm -hmm. time. That's right. And. So they were really still trying to figure out what they wanted to be when they grew up. And they sure didn't know what they were going to do with women in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And an awful lot of the um, old soldiers didn't think that women, they could be in the Air Force if they were nurses or administration, but that was all they were good for. Mm -hmm. And I was neither one. So I was kind of a fish out of water. Were there many women there or that came in in January 52, early 52? Not when I look back on it now. There were um, probably a couple hundred of us that came through. And of course this was the beginning of the Korean War mm -hmm. and they were trying to bring, trying to build up the Corps. Um, and, and they had certain things that they thought they needed and no matter what your your aptitude test scores were, you were plugged in wherever they needed you. Okay. And I was plugged in to as, be a parachute rigger. Let's, so, let's back up a little right. bit. Um, just basic training. Did you train with all women and you did pretty much what the guys did? No, or no, no. We Talk about that. We trained separately. We were a very separate part of the base. They had us way over on one side. All the mess hall was separate. The, the barracks, of course, were separate. Um, we hardly saw any men. We were so separate and so far apart. We did not train like the men because at that time they still didn't think that women could do all of that. We did a lot of marching. Um, we did learn how to handle a gun, but I already knew how to handle a gun because my father had taught me to shoot a rifle. Um, we 
we sat in class an awful lot learning about the Air Force and learning about military and military discipline and how you do things and what you do and what you don't do. Um, I was pretty quickly made a, a squad leader and my responsibility was to be sure that everybody was going where they should go and getting there on time mm -hmm. and to when we'd fall out in the morning to lead the the exercises we had to do to to get us going for the day and lead marches quite often. Um, and how long was your training? You know, I think it was three months. I, I, I'm not sure that, I think it was three months. And then part of that we were also, of course we were we were taking aptitude tests to see what where we belonged not that very many of us got into any of the fields for which we were our test scores were mm -hmm. my test scores in electronics for instance were um, nine or ten whichever was the highest my test score for parachute rigging for instance was two the bottom but that's where i was sent because they needed parachute riggers they did not use parachute riggers in the states, they only needed them overseas. Um, they used all civilians within the states. So when I got out of parachute rigging school, then they really didn't know what to do with me. Mm. Tell us about the training of a parachute rigger. Well, we were sent to Chanute Air Force Base in, in uh, Illinois, mm -hmm. and we learned how to rig a parachute. Um, we learned a little bit about the mechanics of how a parachute worked, but it was mostly how to rig it, how to repair it. Um, and then we were to um, go up, put our parachute that we had rigged onto a dummy, a weighted dummy, and we went up and then we would push our dummy out the door and see how a parachute worked. And we were told that we were not allowed to jump, although I wanted to. I happened to fall out the door almost got court-martialed over it. But what, did the wind just pull you out? or I jumped. Oh, you did anyway? <laughs> I did. Because I thought it was fun. And I thought it would be fun. I was pretty adventuresome. And landed fine, rolled and took my parachute down the way. You know, they, taught, they had shown us pictures of how you, how you should, how people jumped and how they when they landed, what they would do. Mm -hmm. And so I was immediately brought before a board and I kept saying it was an accident. I, you know, I just got pulled out. But fortunately, I had watched the pictures well enough that I knew what to do and I got away with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they knew better. Um, tell us how you rig a parachute. Well, you have long, long, long tables and you the, the top of the parachute is at one end with all the cords and then the pack that you pack it into is at the other end. And you have to keep them all straight, keep all the cords straight, keep the parachute folded so that there were no crimps and that there were no extra folds. And then you began folding the parachute and then the rigging, then all the cords and packed it into um, the bag at the end, and depending on what kind of shoot it was. There were backpacks and chest packs, and you learned how to do them both. Mm -hmm. Was it hard to learn? It was very simple. It, it was? was? really nothing to it. And was it all girls that were doing this? No, no. In fact, I have a picture of our class over okay. there, the parachute rigging class. And how long did it uh, take those of you who were given this job to you know, learn it. To learn it. I think we were in school for, I think that was six weeks long, as I recall. Was and, there, a, go ahead, I'm sorry. And then from there we were sent to all over the place. I was sent to, to uh, Waco, Texas. Was there, um, I don't know quite how to ask this, you know, certain cars may have, uh, you know, like the brakes go out on an 08 town and country and uh, 
electronic yeah, doors don't work on a 99 mm -hmm. whatever was there anything about the parachute rigging that maybe consistently if, if there was a problem if there was we never heard about it okay um, the the biggest problem people had and it depended on what their flying status was what kind of parachute where they were going to be in the aircraft mm -hmm. what kind of parachute they wore and some wore both a backpack and a chest pack and the biggest problem with the chest pack was if they didn't remember to put their head back they sometimes got splattered in the face with cords as they came out depending on the wind and the direction and the way they were jumping. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go up when the guys jumped? No. No, it was just the class, that one class, that one time. No, they didn't let me. <laughs> didn't let Especially me you. Again. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> She's not going up again. So they sent you to Waco, Texas? To Waco, Texas, where they did not use, they used civilian backpackers, parachute riggers. So why did they send you there? If they because, were using civilians. The, because the Air Force was, they were really, I was a training base, and they were, they were, they were training pilots, bombardiers, navigators. Um, in fact, this was the base where they had the triple threat program, where they were training pilots to be navigators, navigators to be bombardiers, bombardiers to be uh, pilots. Mm -hmm. And we also had a lot of um, allied Foreign Allied pilots came there for training. Um, they also were training on the the T-33, the, the fighter jet. And so I worked on the flight line, helping to keep track of record classes and helping to keep track of what was going on and working in the high altitude equipment, uh, fitting people, checking out parachutes as they went to classes. So they kind of taught you several things to do, huh? Well, they were trying to find something for me to do since they did, since I wasn't a parachute rigger. Mm -hmm. And it was the, as I said, the Air Force was only five years old at that time, and it was very, very lax. Um, they were trying to keep pilots current who had been in the Second World War, and of course now it was the Korean War, and so they were trying to keep pilots current. They were trying to keep aircraft fixed up and current so it could be used for training primarily, mm -hmm. and if a pilot needed six or eight hours of flight time and the, the aircraft was empty and you didn't have anything to do, you could go up with them. And did you? And, oh yes, <laughs> every opportunity I had. Now were most of the planes jets at this time? No. They were, Still they were just Yeah, they were just, we were towards the end of my tour, I guess the last, almost the last year, they were bringing in the jets. but. They were mostly prop planes at the okay. time. So tell us about an experience or two, if you want, uh, about going up with a pilot. It was it was it was an awful lot of fun. I'm not sure that I should say this publicly, but then don't they, I mean, <laughs> say what you want because it, it is working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it was it was just it was interesting. I loved flying. I would I'd give anything to have the opportunity that women have today in the Air Force. But at that time. You know, they, they didn't even recognize the women in the Second World War who were transporting pilot, uh, transporting planes around the world. Mm -hmm. And they certainly didn't think that women could be a pilot. Yeah, and some of which died. Oh, yes. Towing targets and yes. carrying planes. Yes, absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. and what kind of uh, planes did you fly in? Oh, uh, well, there was a B-25. There were um, the... Uh, 29, B-29. One of the big ones. Yeah, yeah, primarily those two. Okay. And, and, you know, as I said, they had, um, the pilot needed X number of hours. He could go anywhere he wanted in those X number of hours uh, that he had to fly. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes there would be touch and goes, you know, where you land and go off and land and go. and Anything flying, I loved. So even that was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. and watching and learning how to do it and wishing I could be up there too. It was just a fascinating experience. Mm -hmm. Now at Waco, um, were there many other women there? There were, I'm trying to remember, I think there were about a hundred of us and 8,000 men. 
So you guys were all pretty popular. Yeah, it was very interesting. <laughs> but again, we were we were totally separate. I mean, they we had separate barracks, separate mess halls, separate marches. Everything we did was separate. And we ran ahead. into them, and in, in you know, in our jobs or sure. whatever. But mm -hmm. um, um, can you talk about the relationship when you would? meet up with the guys? I mean, with 8,000 men and 100 girls, I'm sure they were it was, it was, bugging you guys were, to yeah, death. It was, yeah. And I had, I've been a tomboy all my life, so um, I knew, I, I can't say I knew how to handle men, but I, they were friends. I made mm -hmm. friends with almost everybody. Um, eventually, um, they did start having some of the wing parades, some of the parades together. Um, we also were, we were in, at first we were in the old-fashioned open bay barracks with just cots and one room at the end for the, for the, um, barrack chief. Mm -hmm. Um, but then they built some new barracks for us and they were more like a college dorm. There were two women to a room, um, with, we shared a bathroom and it was, we thought, pretty elegant. Big improvement? Very big improvement. And we were supposed to move in on a particular date and they hadn't quite finished the floor, hadn't finished sealing the floors, but we moved in anyway. And we were going to have some big Washington people come down and inspect and the WAF, uh, the chair, uh, the, I was going to call her chairman, the WAF leader, squadron leader, or uh, Command leader. What is WEF? WAF, WAF, Women's Air Force. Okay. Because we were we were still not called airmen. We were not. We were Women's Air Force, not the Air Force. All right. In those days, and she came and inspected our barracks and said, "You have spots on this floor. You've got to get it clean, but you can't use any water on this floor because it's not sealed." And so I had a meeting with everybody that evening, and I said, "We're going to get these spots up." And we used bleach, and they all came up. And the next day, when the people from Washington came down and inspected us, the uh, I think he was a bird colonel was not quite as tall as I, and was standing in front of me and saying, "Airman, you were told not to use any water on this floor." And I said, "We didn't use any water on this floor, sir." Well, then how did you get it so clean? We used bleach. You didn't say anything about bleach. And he just walked on. <laughs> Did he? Now, um, can you talk about what you wore? We wore, we finally were allowed to wear fatigues. All of basic training and the first four or five months in Waco, we wore dresses. They were a brown, they were leftover army fatigue dresses, they called them, and, and uh, boots. Uh, up above our ankle boots, combat boots, where well, they weren't quite that high, but they came up over our ankle. Mm -hmm. And then there was a big push to, uh, they said that the women in the Air Force were going to be the best dressed women in the world, and Christian Dior, who was a famous women's clothing designer, designed our uniforms. And because of the work we were doing, said that we needed to wear pants. And mm -hmm. so I, we, we were issued fatigues. And the uniforms were very, very stylish and very nice. Everybody liked wearing them, and we were so glad to get rid of those brown army dresses. Mm -hmm. But we wore, depending on what your job was, my job, because I was on the flight line, we, I was allowed to wear pants. Mm -hmm. and they were fatigues that are similar to what the fatigues are today. Now, when you wore the dresses, did you wear hose also, or no? Depending on what our what, what we were doing, mostly we wore those combat boots and socks. Okay, even with dresses. Even with dresses. Wow, boots with dresses. <laughs> Stylish. <huh>? You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so we were quite pleased when when Christian Dior said they need to wear pants for their jobs. Okay. Um, now you said that. Let's see here. You did. Uh, you checked chutes, you took classes, um, you were involved with high altitude equipment, equipment. their bailout bottles, and check to be sure the parachutes fit them properly, and all that sort of thing. 
for example, with this high altitude equipment, talk about a just a typical day doing that work. Well, it was we had to we had classes going. We had not us, the pilots and navigators and so on. Classes were going on 24 hours a day, and we some of the shifts, depending on what our shift was, we would check everybody out. Had to check to be sure their parachutes fit them properly, and that they had bailout bottles and their at their helmets fitted them properly and everything, mm -hmm. and how to hook up all the equipment. Because some of these, as I said, some of these were uh, foreign uh, students that came, hardly spoke English, had never seen really? some of these, so we had to teach them how to use a bailout vial. And, you know, if you bailed out at high altitude, you didn't, there wasn't much oxygen, so you had to connect the bottle and, and breathe oxygen to you. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a mixture, it wasn't pure oxygen. But, um, until you got to a level, you know, an altitude where there was enough oxygen. Um, but some of it was teaching them how to use them how to, and be sure they had everything they needed and then checked out who went out and then, then as they came back in, we checked in all the equipment and to be sure they all came back okay. correctly and everything. So, so you didn't have any interpreters? They Language spoke interpreters? some, no, we didn't have any interpreters. They spoke some English, but not very much. Okay. And from what countries did they come from? Oh, Saudi Arabia, France, um, Germany. We had some Germans. I uh, don't remember that we had any Asians. Middle Eastern. And these were like student pilots. Still student pilots. They had been, they were pilots in their country, but they came to the United States because they we were sending. United States aircraft to those countries, okay. and so they had to learn how to use them. And occasionally there would be a crash, and if you were on duty, you went out and helped pick up the pieces. Has that ever happened to you? Oh yes, Just two or three different times, and, and it was kind of sad because you had probably fitted their parachutes or helped them get their equipment. and. And part of it was because of the language, they didn't understand their instructions and, or, or panicked when something wasn't working right and, and didn't quite remember how they were supposed to do whatever they're supposed to do to get out of the spin or get out of... Mm -hmm. And I can remember one of the times he had, the pilot had, he was in a T-33 and he had flipped over, and the the uh, control tower, we were told later, was talking him through how to get get out of the spin and get I mean get out of upside down and back up. But he either panicked or he didn't understand, and he ejected. Well, that oh, was upside down. Thing to do. <laughs> yeah, that mm -hmm. was one of them that I helped pick up. Wow. So, um, did you spend the whole two years, the whole or the rest of, of the two years right. there at Waco? I had met my husband there, and or met the man I married. In fact, I met him the day I arrived on base. Um, and several months later, we started dating because we would run into each other. He was he was writing some of the training manuals for the um, APs for the Air Force, uh, the um, Air Police. And he was, his name was Bill, Bill. right? Was Bill. Mm -hmm. And and met each other, and we began dating, and, and a year later married. So you had kind of had a steady guy the whole time the whole you were time, there. Yeah. So you didn't have to fight off all, so the, all the others. All the others. And we had both before we knew each other, or before we started dating so seriously, had both signed up for every overseas assignment there was, because I wanted to see the rest of the world, and so did he. And so we got married, came back. We were at different bases by the time we got married, because he was sent to Victoria in Texas to help to reopen that base, and I was still in Waco. And when we got back from our honeymoon, we were both on overseas assignments. He was to the Far East and I was to Paris, France. <laughs> so we, he got out of his assignment and then asked for a hardship transfer to Waco and so we ended up back together again.
Okay. Did, um, again, with so many guys and so few women, did most of the girls, did, did several girls end up meeting what became their I husband think so. then? I think so. There were, there were some that didn't, um, some that just unfortunately dated everyone who wore pants. Um, but there were some others who, who married. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, it remake, my, reminds me of what you said about um, no scholarships for women because all they want is a husband. Sure. Yeah, it was the same. <laughs> so I ended up getting married anyway. Yeah. I, just, I just had my scholarship though. Mm -hmm. Bill and I both, after we got out of the service, um, at the, in those days women were not allowed to go into the reserves either. Um, when you got married, they tried to talk you into getting out. They couldn't force you out, but they tried to talk you into getting out. Did they? Yes. And well, and then I got pregnant. Just too. the girls, probably. Just the not girls. The guys. No, not the guys. Just the girls. <laughs> and then I got pregnant three or four months later, and then you had to get out. You had no choice. You got pregnant three or four months? After I got married, um, yeah. yeah. And it was interesting as I was going through the processing out, a very, very shy young man was doing the paperwork and started in his spiel about, are you interested in the reserves and it's a good idea and all of the great things. And I said, look down there to see why I'm getting out. And he just blushed red, purple, and green, I think, when he saw that it was because I was pregnant. And you didn't have a choice in that, huh? didn't have any choice, no. I would have stayed in. I, I think there was... I'm a flag waver anyway, and I think there's a lot to be said for serving your country, but they wouldn't let me. And Bill wanted to get out. He, he, he wanted to get someplace and settle down. We didn't, but he, that's what he wanted. Mm -hmm. Now, when you got out and Bill was still in, were you still able to stay with him? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. we had, you know, we had off off cam oh, off campus, off base nice. housing. And, and it was, I, I think I had mentioned before, it was interesting how many old soldiers in, from the Second World War had, were still in or had been called back because of their various mm -hmm. uh, ASF, you know, what, the, what the job they were needed. A lot of them did not approve of the women in their service. I, there was one old soldier, he was a master sergeant, had been in, by that time, I think he'd been in 20 years or more, and he did everything he could to, to see that I didn't stay around, or that, that I, the, the captain in charge of the, of the training session, the training uh, command there, was forever calling me and he said, Bobby, what have you done now? <laughs> Because yeah. the guy was making some complaints, <clears throat> and most of it was petty little things. So I didn't, uh, I didn't file something right, or I didn't write the right instructions on a training, write debrief on a training or something. Um, he was constantly trying to get me in trouble to get me out of a unit. Okay. Do you feel like um, that was the case for most of your service, that you were really under the gun to do it right? Yes, yeah. I think, especially in those days, we had to be, we had to be better than the average to just be treated average. We had to constantly prove ourselves. And our WAF commander was forever holding meetings, talking about, you've got to be above average, you've got to do things, you've got to behave better than everybody else because everybody's looking at you. Mm -hmm. And we were having lectures of that sort constantly. And um, how long after you got out did Bill get out? Um, yeah, eight months later. You got out in 54? Right. Do you we remember got what out month? at the end of the year, 54. Do you remember what month? I think, I think mine was March or was it April? I think it was March 54 and he got out at the end of the year. So he got out about nine months later. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as you look, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? Well, I was going to say, you know, as I mentioned, they were really trying to figure out something for me to do that was 
more worthwhile than just keeping track of records. And about that time, they were the base, James Conley Air Force Base, was wanting to build a swimming pool because there wasn't one at the time. And in discussions, or maybe it was on my application or something, I was a water safety instructor trainer. And so they put me in charge of the base swimming pool, and I ended up running the pool and then teaching pilots, teaching any of the air crew that didn't know how to swim to teach them how to swim. A water safety what did you call it? Water safety instructor trainer. So I trained lifeguards. And put in charge of the base pool? Right. Mm -hmm. And um, and then was and the base pool then was open for recreational swimming for yeah. anybody. Yeah. But then we also had classes for any air crew that didn't know how to swim and taught survival swimming. And how long were you there at El Paso? At Waco. When that, or Waco, I'm okay. sorry. When that when you got that job. I mean, you're doing the parachute rigging. Right. I did and you're that. You're working high altitude equipment right. and... Right. That was probably six months. I would have to go back and... I think, it was, I think I was working high altitude equipment for about six months and then they were opening the swimming pool and I spent the rest of my time there. And how did they know to get you involved, did you say? Because on my application, I guess, there, or part of my history said that I was a WSIT, a water safety instructor trainer. And that was great fun. How so? I was in a swimming pool all day long, teaching men how to swim, teaching them how to do survival swimming. In, in hot and Texas, huh? In hot Texas, right. Yeah. Not a bad tour of doing You're right. It, huh? You're yeah. right. Yeah. Well, as you look back over the whole thing, Bobby, excuse me, Barbara, mm -hmm. um, is there anything that, I mean, getting married certainly was a highlight. Is there anything that's more of a vivid memory to you than, say, anything else? or No, just... Um, I think the camaraderie, the, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. It was, to me, it was a, a wonderful way of growing up. You know, as I said, I was kind of brought up to think I was pretty hot stuff, and then when I got out in the world, I found out that everybody didn't think so, and I had to grow up, and and I learned how to get, a, get along with an awful lot of different kind of people. Mm -hmm. um, I firmly believe that everybody should have to spend two years of service to their country, one way or another. It doesn't always have to be military, but I think it's a great way to grow up. Anything else you'd like to conclude with? And the opportunities that women have today are fantastic, and I wish I had them then. Yeah, it's really changed, hasn't it? It certainly has. I remember when my wife and I started um, really getting into genealogy after we moved here. We would go back to uh, many of the old, old cen census records. Mm -hmm. They didn't list the women. I know it. They didn't put their names in. No, it was we just were the channel. Channel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I Barbara, <laughs> thank you for stopping by and um, doing this interview with you, with me, and uh, we thank you for your service to our You're country. You're welcome. I'm proud of it. Good. Well, Barbara, we're looking at a picture. Tell us what we're looking at. This is a picture of the class, of the parachute rigging class at Chanute Air Force Base. Your class? In my class. I don't see many women in that picture. I was the only woman in that. And there you are. And then um, you had just told me now that you, when you switched uniforms to the Christian Dior uniforms, you modeled those for a brief time. Why don't right. you show us one of those? This was the uniform that Christian Dior designed for the women in the Air Force, and I modeled this in Waco in J at James Conley Air Force Base when we first when we first got them. Okay. And then you have another picture of you with the guide on in the parade. Let's see that one. And where was this at? 
This one was at uh, Chanute Air Force Base. Okay. Just and it was a base um, command parade for some visiting dignitaries, and I was the guide on. And and why were you the guide on? Uh, because I was tall, and everybody could see me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you.